welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online summit exploring pathways to more healthy and regenerative ways of being and of the potential of transformation within the conflicts that we experience. I'm Eva Schonfeld, one of the three hosts, and today I'm speaking to Alison Fornes, um, who's in the US in the Massachusetts near Boston. Um, and Alison has Alison's kind of work comes from um, a kind of core desire to create positive social change uh, in the world. Um, and for many years, that has been through both practicing and training in uh, others in constellation work. Uh, so we'll be hearing lots more about that from her. Now, Alison, welcome and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Nice job with the introduction. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to start by um, asking you about your own, you know, your personal relationship with conflict. How's, how's that been for you over the years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's such a funny question because I, as I, as I sort of became aware about how to respond to conflict, I was like, oh, I think I'm a conflict avoider. <laughs> That's my response to conflict. Um, and so I can see that really in a lot of, a lot of my relationships. I'm a, I was the kind of person who even as a child, I, I figured out what, the, if there was an expression, the, the expression, if you can't beat them, join them. Now, I, it wasn't my nature to beat them, but it was definitely my nature to join them. I was, I was able to learn how to be um, sort of sensitive what, to the, uh, the needs of another person. And, and so what that would mean is that it might just, again, part of my nature and personality is I would tend to probably get those boundaries a little bit more uh, blended than was healthy or appropriate. Um, and so part of, so for me, part of my own journey around conflict is actually <clears throat> allowing myself to lean in to conflict, allowing myself to um, receive conflict as information. Um, allowing myself to uh, start to notice when conflict arises and all the things that get triggered around conflict, that those are cues for me. Uh, uh, and for me right now, the biggest clue and cue that I pay attention to is really around when my defenses go up, where's my ego? <laughs> what's going on with my ego? What's behind those defenses? So that's a lot of what I, I find myself paying attention to. And, I, and in my work, um, in terms of being able to sense into systems, that's when I allow myself to sort of inquire. I am able to step into that system and feel, oh, what is behind, what's behind this defense that's just emerged? Yeah, yeah that's, that's really helpful. It's so, it's so um, important, that learning, isn't it? And, and that kind of self-soothing for, for those of us who find conflict really stressful. Um, mm -hmm. That, that being able to receive it as as good information and as useful information is mm -hmm. quite, it's quite a knack, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. Right now, my latest uh, my my latest personal innovation is the humor. Hopefully, you know people figure this out already. But to, just to be able to bring more humor to myself when the pattern the pattern that would usually be walls up, get defensive. To see that and and approach that with some humor in my uh, in myself, so I don't get so attached to what what's what's going on. Uh, mm -hmm. Great. And you you were telling me a little bit about the the kind of journey that led you to find constellation work in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you shared in the beginning that um, you know I think I suspect like a lot of the people who are joining us, there's a a, a sort of core heart longing to create um, a, a, a thriving planet, a thriving interconnected, just um, relationships and connection. And so for me that one of the ways that has manifested is uh, becoming involved, um, oh gosh, now it's probably 15 years ago. Uh, t let's just say 10, let's say 10 years ago, but, um, so it's about 10 years ago, but we're in establishing an intentional community. And so, 
um, the statistics on on groups of people deciding it's a good idea to create an intensive community and then actually creating one, are, are <laughs> the, the, they mostly fail. Um, but this one actually, I will tell you that, that this one, we did create a community, it exists now and a lot of our intention, I would say continues. Although the core group of people um, who came together around that community, um, while we are still connected and, and really intimately connected because of that journey, some of us have, are also, we've, we sort of severed relationships. And so while that was happening, while, we're, while we were, we had gone through this arc of coming together as a community, we, we were feeling ourselves in the, in the space of a shared vision. Mm -hmm. We manifested this um, uh, property and people had moved in. And within a very short time, um, conflicts arose that, that resulted in this fracturing. But just, you know, just as we were sort of not quite fully fractured yet, but on a sort of about, just about that space, I discovered constellation work. And so when I discovered constellation work, I thought, oh, maybe this is it. Maybe this thing um, will, will be some medicine for what we're going through. Um, I'm aware that there's probably, there's like layers and layers of story in there, but, but just at that first level, I discovered through people telling me stories, um, family constellations and systemic constellations, which I, 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 I think I define one as, as working more with the personal and interpersonal, um, systems and the other systemic constellations more with, can, can apply to, to other kinds of systems that are not necessarily that are not solely human centered, but can include organizations and can include, you know, earth systems as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll pause and see if there's any. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just really feeling you. I mean, I've, I've trodden that path as well towards, um, you know, setting up a community and then having it all fall apart. And it's so tragic because the intentions are so good and, um, and I think it's the same often in, in you know, groups like transition groups. Yes. Um, people mean so well and want so much to do a good thing and mm -hmm. <laughs> end up just not being able to cope with what then comes up between them. And, and you know, hence basically this, this, um, this summit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm really interested. So did you get to use Constellation uh, yeah. uh, Good question. <laughs> um, well, I'll talk a little bit about how I understand things now, and then I'll tell you what happened. Okay. So I, you know, here we are, all of us in our community. We've come together. We and that what's what's you know from your experience, there's something really compelling about what you call what you're calling your shared vision, mm -hmm. and you actually think it's the same. And then the more you get to know each other, you realize, oh, it, it's, not, it's not exactly the same. And, in, and it's not necessarily even that the vision itself you disagree on. It, there's something about how it's being implemented. There's something about how you're relating to me. There's some, you know, all sorts of the, the multiple ways, the 10,000 ways in which mm, this happened. We start to rub against each other. And all of a sudden, the person you thought was your ally, you're really having this question of, can I even trust you? You know? And so what, what, um, what I started to see and what I see now is that, that so much of that space that emerges in these interpersonal relationships are really about these patterns. So I've got my, my the way I see it is I've got my, you could say my true self, but I've got some core essence of myself. And then <laughs> also wound up in this, this, this being of me, I've got all these patterns, patterns that came from how I was raised, patterns that come from ancestral patterns. A lot of those patterns are actually connected to trauma. So a lot of the sort of most persistent and the ones that really act as grooves in terms of I've been caught and now I'm gonna act, respond in this way. Those are, those are 
you know, created through trauma. And, uh, and of course, I am, I am doing my work, but and I'm also not always conscious of, of when I'm caught in that pattern. And so what we see in from family constellations is that I may sort of project unconsciously this dynamic. So you and I are in a, some kind of tension or conflict, and it's not just me and you. It's me and you and whatever that pattern is that I've inherited, that I and I'm seeing my relationship with you through that the lens of this pattern, this trauma. And and what we know through constellation work is that that, that pattern or trauma may be personal to me in terms of my lived lifetime of experience. And it's also the result of patterns that have, we've inherited through our, our ancestors that we may actually have no idea the real cause mm -hmm. of that initial trauma. And so there's a, there's a heart, a repeating through, through my body of the pattern, but, a, but um, my mind actually doesn't really understand where the origins is. And so yeah. maybe I think it's with you, or maybe I think it's with my own life, you know, my own childhood. But what if it's actually something back here? And that's the kind of thing that you can touch into. You can kind of start to piece those threads apart in in family constellation. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's extraordinary that you can do that kind of tracking back through generations, presumably with people who aren't in the room. And yet yeah. there's, there's some there's some way of kind of um, reading those traces mm -hmm. um, of what's been left behind yeah um I'll, I'll 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 tell a little story of my first time and i think it will illuminate a lot of i have um you know the thing the thing about systemic constellations and, and bert hellinger's teaching mm. Bert Hellinger is the father of this work and, and, and our teacher, all of our teachers at yeah. some, uh, at some point. Um, but what, one of the, th the things that we receive from him, both are this ability to work in this embodied or intuitive way. Um, there's a language that I learned from another teacher uh, that I, whose name escapes me, but this other teacher speaks about the undefended body that I have access to information through the soma that isn't defended by my ego. Mm -hmm. And so when I can access, I can make contact directly with, an inf with information that's arising right here, um, there's, a, there's, some, there's information, there's a truth in there that I can get to. So there's the practice, that's the practice of being in the field and doing constellation work. And then there's um, these systemic laws that, Bert Hellinger teaches, and I, I, I'll um, I'll go over them in a bit, but 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 I'll tell this I'll tell a story, um, which is my first time after after discovering constellation work and and thinking that it might be a good idea for our community. I was able I finally made my way to a workshop for the first time, and I was asked to represent. So a typical constellation, you're in a circle and someone has an issue, and then he, the person, uh, the client will choose people from the group and say, will you represent my, me? Or will you represent my father? Or, and so you, you'll stand there and feel. So in this case, the, the client was presenting an issue. And the issue was that um, he was working with a, a mentor, a man he admired, who was a, a leader in their, their shared field of work, and helping him write a book. And he said, I'm having this problem where every time I approach him and we begin our work together and we'll spend some time together writing, it's great. And then the moment I turn to leave or the, you know, our time is up together, we'll get into some kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. And this has happened a few times and I, I can't quite figure out what's going on. <laughs> so the facilitator said, choose a person to represent you and a rep person to represent your mentor and we'll place them in the field. And so there are these two people chosen, they're standing facing each other. 
And uh, they both report that they're feeling kind of wobbly. And so the facilitator says, okay, choose a second person to represent you and a second person to represent your mentor. So the mentor shows up here and I'm chosen as the second client. And I'm standing there facing this person in front of me. And I, my body is, I've never done this before and I'm certain that I'm doing this wrong. I mean, that's the thing, that's what you'll experience when you go to a constellation, you'll be certain that you're doing it wrong. <laughs> But I'm standing there and I'm thinking, uh, <laughs> I, my body feels like it's being magnetically pulled to the ground. And so the facilitator encouraged me to follow my movement and I'm laying now flat on the ground, my face down. And the facilitator turns to the client and says, who is that? And the client looks at me and he says, that looks like my sister. She died when we were both children. And my family in their grief, my parents in their grief, packed up the house, moved to a different town, and never spoke of her again. <laughs> so the consolation continued and we, we sort of you know, things unfold and we get to this closing moment. And in the closing moment now I'm standing up. Oh, I'll say, I'll just tell you this one thing that happened. The moment he mentioned his sister, all of a sudden, all of the energy, this funny sensation I'd felt where the whole front surface of my body was being strangely magnetically pulled into the ground and I was shivering, I was cold. All of a sudden, my head popped up. I felt very childlike. Mm -hmm. and, I was, and the thought that came into my mind was, I'm so glad you're talking about me. Um... So as the constellation continues, I'm standing up now, we're at the very end, and mm -hmm. I'm facing this person who's, who was chosen to be the second, the second mentor. Mm -hmm. And at this point, it's been identified that he's the father. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I can feel the emotion. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I look at this person who's a stranger to me, like on the sort of normal level <laughs> of peers, people in the workshop, he's a complete stranger to me. And yet I see this man and I, I've often described it as, um, you know, when you look at the sun, when you see the sun streaming through the window and there's all these little specks of dust in it, mm. it actually felt to me like light that has nothing in the middle, like nothing interfering. It was just this pure light of love. And I, it was such a strong sensation. And mm. so when he, the facilitator said, follow your movement, <laughs> and we, we embraced. And it was such a powerful sensation mm. to feel this unfiltered love in the mm. context of this funny workshop mm. but then the other sort of dimension behind that is that um and this is a bit of a sort of personal thing for me but um i didn't grow up with my biological father and so there's a there was a father and daughter moment reunion that was happening that that also had deeply personal significance for me. And I think one of the, one of the reasons why this work is so powerful is that there's, there's so much sort of hidden mystery <laughs> that's unfolding even in the apparent randomness of, of me being cho chosen to be who would, the person who would ultimately have a reunion with her father. Extraordinary. Wow, a lovely story. And uh, yeah, for, from the, the small amount of work I've done, I, I did a, a, a role play exercise as part of a, a nonviolent communication um, circle where we all had to uh, pretend to be the other person in the conflict. And, and going around a circle of, you know, 20 people doing this, every single person who knew the situation not the not the role player said yes that's exactly what they would say and there's something about that kind of incredible capacity of our empathy that that you know that has got access to so much more information and so many more layers of reality and experience than we you know can ever could ever really imagine that it has really beautiful beautiful stuff
that's yes, it's uncanny, right? <laughs> I, um, empathy is system sensing. That's one of the things I I came to understand through this work is that one when, when we experience empathy, you know, in a kind of like, oh, here's a person. I can sense that there's something wrong. This is a person I might see all the time, and but right now I'm really feeling something when they're coming in to meet with me. Um, when that happens, when that particular sensation, we can feel empathy under lots of circumstances, but in this particular kind of experience where I'm suddenly feeling something about this person that I hadn't felt yesterday. It's happening under a very specific set of circumstances. I'm sensing something where if I could see what's behind them, I would see a, a, a particular systemic dynamic, mm. something that has shifted from the last time I saw them. Mm. And so one of the things I like to talk about is how when we recognize that actually this is a capacity where it's all, we have it available to us all the time. You know, if we can read a, a book, enjoy fiction or a movie and sort of that experience of, did we get frozen? You, know, you broke up a little bit there. Okay. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that's us back. I did have uh, some quite bad internet troubles earlier on today, so I hope that's not okay. Uh, reasserting itself. You had just been talking about there there being a lot of systems, you know, that have will have changed behind that person that, that they're right. coming from. That's right. And so the experience of empathy is actually a very specific. You're 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 experiencing a specific system, a shift in the system. And, yeah. um, you know, I would say that even our capacity to uh, it, the, um, enjoy a movie and have that experience of the suspension of disbelief, is that the expression? That that is all, it's the same mechanism that allows us to be in a constellation, that I'm experiencing actually a specific systemic moment, sets of dynamics. Um, yeah, yeah. I have a I have a slide to show. Oh, great! Okay, <laughs> and that which I think um, I'm going to show it because I I it shows. Let's see if I can get it going. Um, here. I'm going to just can I optimize? Okay, I'm just going to let this be. If, yeah, uh, you can see it. Okay. Yes, I can. So, um, a constellation, a systemic, a family constellation like the one I've just described, the, what we're trained to look at and what, what you're experiencing is, uh, starts with this question of what belongs in this system. And, and when we look at this big question, what belongs? Then when we look at, when we feel that a system is out of order, then we're also asking, okay, what has been included and what's been excluded in the system? Because it's really this question of what's been excluded that needs to come back into the system in order to resolve, you know, create a healthy flow um, of life and of love in the system. And what we see is that there is something that mediates this uh, membrane, this, uh, this, uh, around the boundary around what's included and that's we it's uh, most often survival so for example in the story i told the parents grief the weight of that grief really felt like they could not survive yeah. and so out of this you know need to survive um the sort of life force need to survive they made a choice to exclude something. And man, I don't know how, who knows how conscious or unconscious it was, but there was a, the, what, what happened was something got excluded in this case, the daughter out of, out of the grief. So she was excluded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because it felt with, with, with her included, they couldn't survive. That's right. That's right. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. And so this is the this is really the core dynamic that we're looking at anytime we're looking at it, really any system 
you know, every healthy system has had to make choices about what's not part of the system and what is. But if something's part of the system that that has been excluded, then that, then that actually creates some kind of disease in the system. So, so around that kind of where that 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 line of of survival is, mm-hmm. uh, I guess you could you could also write trauma because exactly. that that tends to be when the trauma kicks in is when, uh, particularly when we're we're young, where it, it it feels like I might not survive this. That's exactly right. Um, That's exactly yeah. Right. Yeah, right. So, and then that bit gets kind of partitioned off and, mm-hmm. and frozen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is so this is also about kind of reincorporation and moving towards wholeness. That's right. That's mm. exactly right. That's really all of um of of a family constellation, but really any systemic constellation is bringing us back into wholeness. And so we're we're learning the tools that there's a that that. Being in the field, that somatic experience of feeling a system, which helps us see, you know, when we're when things are excluded, there's a kind of um, don't look over there, yeah, and so yeah. we need a tool. We need we need a way to get behind what's being otherwise masked by the trauma. Yeah. And so that's why we're working in this more intuitive and somatic way because we're we're we want to go to that undefended space to figure out what's been excluded. And also using other people's sense of empathy and and intuition. Um, That's right. They're 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 dif- they be fragmented differently. Um, mm-hmm. and maybe able to pick up uh, yeah. things that we're missing. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it seems it's such a strange way that we're built, isn't it? That, that those very things that that we need to become more ourselves are unconscious. Mm-hmm. And there's work to be done mm-hmm. to um, to reconnect with them. It's, mm-hmm. It doesn't just it doesn't just get handed to you on a plate. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, one of the things I think about is how what powerful creators we are that we've created a sets of systems that make us believe, you know, that would have us believe and operate from the idea that we are separate from the whole. I mean, so that's that itself, you know, is a impressive (laughs) impressive creation Mm -hmm. um but ultimately and i think all of our work you know when we're feeling into um even even the paradigm shift part of what we're asking is look you've excluded our relationship to to nature you've excluded our relationship you you know who it's been excluded right our relationship to nature we've we've emphasized um oppression and, and extraction uh, and trauma as a fuel as opposed to connection and regeneration. I'm, you know, I know we all know this, but that's, that's also in this, in this little map here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really uh, useful take on, yeah, of course, you know, we, we know this and yet to see it uh, depicted so simply there is really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. I want to just show the next one more piece here and then we can you know make some decisions about where to go next but um i think especially for interpersonal conflict it really helps um to work with what what i referred to earlier as these laws these systemic laws that we see operating over and over again in terms of creating healthy systems and certainly now Bert Hellinger was a psychologist, among many things, but but, but he, he, when he was developing this, he was as a psychologist, and so he's working with people. And so this system showed up first as family systems. And then facilitators, including Hellinger, have have learned to make to ask questions about how it applies to other systems. So we'll look at family systems first. You, you, you're on mute. Thank you. So um, these are the orders of love. Every family constellations facilitator will will know them because we've internalized them. We're feel we're sensing them operating in the system. And the first rule rule the first dynamic that we see is that everyone who belongs belongs. 
So in this story, for example, that little girl, she belongs. And there's a, there's a need to just acknowledge her, acknowledge her belonging in the system. And in fact, so much, so much of the healing in that constellation I described happened simply in the client saying, that's my sister. And then all of a sudden, my my representation, my energetic representation, just completely shifted. And so it, it was that was what initiated a healing movement. Is that all of a sudden, this inclusion of what had been excluded happened. The other thing, um, yeah, the next law is the balance of give and take, and that. I think, you know, we, we recognize that we see that in lots of different systems, but what the way that shows up in, in family systems is that when someone gives to you, there's a kind of uh, a, a debt that the system will create a certain pressure to, um, to respond to a giving and receiving. The one place that that's different is, is in parents, parents give to children and, the, the systemic order is that parents give to children and there's no expectation of, of returning. A child cannot really return, give anything in exchange for the gift of life that they've received from the parents, but they can pay it forward. That's all for us as children, part of the way in which we sort of think about that. The balance is paying it forward. There's an order in place for everyone. So um, one, uh, one, one area of work that I have is with educators and, and helpers, change makers, you know, that, that's uh, ma- most people on this call, I would say all people on this call. Um, and one thing that we can do as change makers is that we can cross boundaries. We want to help and we can easily kind of like swoop in and try to take on things that are not ours to take on. And so finding our right place in relationship to the ones we're serving is a part of it, the systemic order. And whenever, when, we, when we're out of place, when we're, when we're out of order, out of place, again, the system will feel it. It's mm. going to get expressed in the system in some way. Yeah, and not necessarily di- directly. That's right. You, know, you don't necessarily get told that you're in the wrong place, <laughs> but you, That's right. you, can, you can pick it out, I guess, by by looking at the system. Oh, That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And so, um, I'll I can I can keep this up or I can stop the share. But but what I want to say is that when we're in conflict, so there's couple things that are that can happen so my experience I you know we can go back to my I'll stop the share for this um so I you know I have as I said I found this work when I was in the context of establishing a community that was actually falling apart and part of my nature is wanting to be a mediator and I was going back and forth between these two spaces um It's interesting. I was going to tell you one one version of the story, and I, the set, another different version showed up. Mm-hmm. What I want to say about that. So, what I want to say is, any time, I, I mean, most times, any every time, I don't know, but many times, when there is some kind of conflict that's showing up, and you're caught in it, your own patterns are going to be involved. And so I was going to tell you about the patterns I was seeing as a kind of outside person, but I'll, I'll be much more honest and tell you about how I got entangled, which is I'm operating in my mediator role. And when I did a personal constellation, later about the kind as a little girl wanting to bring these two parts so you want to a, a little bit there um, yeah, I see that. you just started talking about when you were in the mediator role okay so I, here i am in a mediator role and feeling very passionate and unusually 
sensitive. I, I would, I will say I wasn't, I wasn't, there wasn't a space of equanimity. It was like one person would say something and I would get super emotional and, and like, like, Oh yeah, I totally understand you. And then another person would say something and it was be the other, you know, I'd be the same way. And I'm going between, I'm really feeling torn, conflicted in here. And so when I did some personal work around that constellation, what showed up was my relationship as a child between my mother and my stepfather and the, the desire I had to try to keep them together as they were coming apart. But when I looked behind that even more, I saw that part of what was happening is that there was a, I, I won't tell you, I won't be able to tell the whole story, but, but, but there will be, a, that there was another, another layer, which is that my stepfather and I were in a kind of third dynamic where I could feel, I recognized through this, through a constellation that he was looking in me to become the daughter that he had lost. And I was looking in him to become the father that I had lost. And, mm. and we just couldn't connect. Mm. And, and really only once I was able to sort of untangle all the ways in which I was personally activated by this conflict and community was I able to be of any real service. And ultimately the service was allowing it to, in, the, in this case, to, for the parts to go their own way. Because our, this, our community, this community, there had already been enough of a degradation of trust that we actually couldn't have done a constellation together. There, there wasn't enough, it, the process was too new for, for people. They, they just didn't no longer felt they could trust each other. And so that, you know, we sort of let that go. Yeah, which is which can be a really difficult thing to do in itself. And, you know, groups can kind of soldier on in the face of, you know, really, really needing not to. And yet nobody quite has what it takes to say, look, this isn't isn't working any longer. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was it, it sounds like it really was a service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and you know really really cleanly done to have done all that work on yourself and to understand <laughs> your own your own oh. pattern. <laughs> I'm glad I, I gave you the illusion of clean. <laughs> I didn't feel clean at all. Um, it really just like it just insisted itself. You know, I was I was in, engaged in a training and the you know I said yes to to being open and it just like. Yeah. insisted that I would know you know that I would go through these these pieces yeah yeah mm -hmm. yes they, they can be a bit remorseless those places yeah have kind of agreed to them <laughs> that's right you don't get yeah. to sort of pull through mm -hmm. um I wonder whether um we should shift from looking at those kind of interpersonal um uh sort of dynamics to the more you were talking about looking at transforming systems and I think yeah. that's something that people would be really interested to hear about and uh, your mm -hmm. perspective on that yeah well so family systems there's so much value you know I I, I, I highly recommend anyone who's who's you know any, anytime you're doing relation which we all are so you know even just to learn about family systems to get uh, from a constellation's view and to start to get some understanding about the way those systemic laws show up and you'll start to recognize it as you look at your own relationships. Oh yeah, there it is. There's the balance of give and take, or there's the, you know, I'm out of order here or, you know, um, so that that's a foundation for everything I do. And it also creates then a field because, um, because I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, it's like uh, kind of seeing things from a different dimensions, you know, there's a way in which we can see things from a kind of in a kind of two dimensional way. And then all of a sudden we see things now in a three or, or multiple dimension way. Mm. And so for me, the gift of, of the work includes now that I'm, I'm perceiving multiple dimensions, some, many of which are often hidden to just because of the way we have been conditioned to relate to each other so 
that means then that the next level for me uh, is that I really pay attention to the collect, what are the collective systems, the larger systems around um, the things that drive systems of oppression and systems of extraction and, and what would it take to transition them. And recognizing that when we're change makers, that is a con that's a conflict, you know. Uh, um, so I'll share, I have two maps and we'll see if I can share them both, but I'll, I'll share the first one. Um, oh, here we go. So, this is beautiful. Look, isn't this beautiful? <laughs> um, when I think about collective fields, there's a, a, a phrase, a term that another constellator used, um, and it just stayed with me. She spoke about the field. Let's see if I can remember her name. Um, oh shoot, it's my brain, it's escaping my brain. Luea, a Luea, Luea Ritter. She used the expression, um, the field that holds the field. And she was, she gave it in a particular context, but for me, I sort of, I stayed with that idea. And through other kinds of work, I started wondering about what would it take to to change. Now we think about, we might think about change in terms of individuals. You have, you change and then you change, you know, this sort of transformation, you and then you and then you. But there's also, of course, a collective field. There's a kind of field of culture, of, of, of um, patterns, of systems. And what would it take to change that field? Not just all the individuals, but the field itself. And to transform that field from one of harm oppression and extraction, one that's fueled. So systems of oppression and extraction are fueled by separation. They're fueled by trauma. So trauma is actually, you know, for, for people, for systems that benefit from oppression and abstraction, that it benefits those systems to have separation, to have trauma. And so what would it take to transition out of that into a field of harmony? So I have this triangle. This triangle um, was taught to me by an, a, my good friend and thinking partner, um, Marianne Connor, and she learned it uh, in a regenerative design course. Um, maybe you're familiar with this. Are you familiar with this triangle? No, I've not seen it before. Okay. Well, you'll 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 see it everywhere now. <laughs> I, I'm really liking it. So, <laughs> um, so this is um, this is like you could think of this as the triangle of manifestation what does it take to make something exist um, one way to think of it is I am I'm inspired to create um, uh, a vessel so the need might be an, an activating force the clay is a restraining force mm -hmm. and my creativity is what will reconcile that clay and into the need for a vessel, into the thing, the pot that I create. Okay. So the an activating force, a restraining force, and a reconciling force. How's the clay restraining in that? Mm -hmm. Because I might imagine a vessel of, you know, maybe I want my vessel to be whatever, right? right. But it's actually, I'm limited. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is why it's in, you can see I put love here. It's an interesting way. Now we can, we can, once you get the, the sort of start looking for activating, restraining, reconciling forces, restraining can show up in lots of different ways. You know, restraining can show up in a kind of more like don't go there kind of way. But I think it's interesting to think about love as a restraining force. Because if you can imagine, for example, that I've got a lot of power and a lot of creativity, I can create all sorts of systems that are not founded on love, but that can generate for me, let's say, a lot of wealth, mm. a lot of power, a lot of like a sort of power over power, you know, systemic power uh, or a system of harm. 
But when I decide I want to create that in a way that takes advantage of my capacity as a creator, my power as a creator, you know, we could look at different things to call the activating force, but let's call it power for now. And my love for the planet and for people. And look at how do I bring those things together creatively to create a field of harmony. We, we can look even, um, I'll say something else here about this because I, I love this triangle. I use it so many, I'm using it all the time. Um, another way to think of it as uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Another way to think of it is um, you could think of an activating and a restraining force. And it, instead of going up, in a beautiful reconciling way, it drops down in, into a compromise where both parts have had to give things up. And so this, this dynamic is really useful mm, yeah, to, to look at. Yeah. So when we realized uh, that, uh, you know, we have some sort of sense of the system and what's operating we can also start start to ask questions like why why is my system not up you know we say we have an intention for x and instead we're getting this other thing you know what's what's really influencing this field here and there are times when i actually use this i actually have people will step in and will represent the activating the restraining and the reconciling forces and just feel how the forces are interacting and, and how they're showing up in the field yeah, it sounds like a really helpful way of grounding it because they're quite abstract um, mm -hmm. in in the way that you know they've showed up in in this diagram. And I can really feel what you're saying, but I would love to do something sort of where you know to feel that in my body. That's um, right. Yeah, I'm going to take a pause there because the thing about these maps is that I draw them because I, but I only draw them after I've been in the field. So they, they it really is. It really is um, f about feeling them um, that makes all the difference. And I'll do. You know, we were speaking about offerings, and I, I have, I have different ways of of um, entering these maps, guided meditations to help you enter the map. You can bring a certain question or intention and feel how these are showing up for you around that question or intention. Yeah, that sounds super useful. So. How would you, could you give a couple of examples of um, like, you know, what's happening just now in the world um, and how you would represent it, how you would show, how things yeah. would show up on that map? Sure. Um, I mean, you know, in this moment uh, 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 of our recording, we are seeing lots of people who are standing up for the voiceless, um, especially around our legacy of racism here in the United States. And we're seeing a response. We're seeing a response to that. So there's a, there's a, just in that dynamic, there's an activating and a restraining force. You could even think of, you could even be more specific and think of the protesters and the police, for example. And now we're at a place where can we get, what would the reconciling force, what could that be? Right now we can imagine we've experienced here in this country and, and really I think this is a global, you know, we all know this in our own ways, however it shows up locally, that those two forces show up together and they often drop down. They don't get into a, a place that actually contains them. They, they get into a place that is excluding parts or they get into a place where there's a kind of power over, you know, I um, will use our, our force to repress that part. And so when we might make an inquiry where we feeling into those activating and restraining forces and then allow ourselves to step in to a reconciling Yeah, well, you know, 
done actually have done work around this. So I have lots of things swirling, and I, I, I um, you know, I'm I'm trying to make some choices right now, but things to say. But you know, part of the way in which something called the police, something called a group of people who are, um, who whose role it is to protect and serve. We can actually see that there's a that there's a systemic, you know, even going back to that first picture, there's a there's something out of order, where the the people who have been elected or uh, or chosen to, to quote unquote protect and serve actually have formed a separate tribe. So they're not they're not a member of the community. They see themselves as separate, and as having their own authority to control this community. So there's there's a systemic problem, which is that actually we cannot create a reconciliation between a force that actually believes its role is to impose authority. It's that it has a separate, it's a separate tribe and its role is to impose authority over here. So part of the movement of reconciliation, even in feeling that, is that we actually have to separate out that, um, oh, I've got, a delivery truck here. <laughs> um, but we have we have to actually separate out and and bring in a healthier version of of people who really feel themselves as set as connected here and 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 see their role as genuinely like I'm one with you and I really want to protect and serve you because we are not separate. And so there's a there's a, a thought form, there's a a systemic dynamic that right now the activating force is actually trying to name, to call out and actually remove from the entity called you know, this this tribe that we're calling the police. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that that the protesters, so the, the police are the restraining force and the protesters are they activating force mm -hmm. yeah i guess it's it's difficult to see how to intervene when things are so institutional um but i guess yeah we are also part of a larger system and there's you know there's certainly huge amounts of response right around the world to what's happening in the u.s and people this evening in in the uk are uh you know, out on the streets and, and outside their houses, you know, socially distanced, um, kneeling in, in support of people uh, you know, mm -hmm. on the streets there, and I'm sure in other countries too. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I, I guess the hope is that, that that kind of energy and that kind of um, sense of, of seeing what's so wrong um, will... will start new conversations. Uh, I, you know, I've seen um, friends of mine who, who are people of color saying, you know, don't just, don't just show up and then think that that's your job done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't just show up one, for one evening because this is a much bigger, and, and for them to be able to say that um, and, you know, and be heard and, be, and for that to be the conversation. That's um, right. Is, is a huge leap from where we are, where we were last week. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I would say, because there's a, there's a few questions in there. There's, there's a specific thing around the police. Uh -huh. And then there's this other la layer, which can be very confusing, which is, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm a white person, let's say, you know, I've, I, I, and I, I, I also disagree with police. Like I can see that I don't want that, you know, but really what's my relationship to that? And I think what I sort of, you know, when you're looking at these layers of systems, the racism has pr provided a cover for this darker dynamic to hide in. So the darker dynamic I'm referring to is the fact that these people have been, the this group, the, the sort of the people who are using brutality and authority as a separate and seeing themselves as separate from the people they serve mm -hmm. that particular dynamic is hidden and actually has been 
um, acceptable because it's stayed low enough under the radar and people who see something called police brutality, they are asking questions like, oh, but do you really know what happened? You know, maybe it's not what you think it is. And so it's, we've actually allowed it to be hidden. And so even just having the question, even just having the conversation where a person says, wait a minute, this is actually that person's life. This is, a, you know, the, the beauty of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, matter is that um, what we're saying is if you look at whatever that policeman saw, let's say they said, oh, he was um, resisting arrest. It, it sounds to the ear of a perceptive person that you're, that, that you're saying, well, the exchange was appropriate. The resisting arrest and their life, right? That's an appropriate exchange. And, the resp and what the voice about a Black Lives Matter is saying is that life mattered. Like, just sit with what that me meant. That exchange was not equal. So we cannot, what, what we're, what's happening is there's an unmasking that we're saying racism has allowed this very dark thing to happen. Most people are not going to be, are not those brutal people who will use violence to kill another person. Yeah, but no, we're not, most people are not gonna do that. But the fact that it's been allowed to happen inside this system, and then allow, we've allowed our own system of racism to further mask that and not question it. That's, what, that's what's being pulled back. And so now we actually have the capacity to recognize, oh, there's, a, there's another systemic dynamic back here, which I've already described. We can change that, actually. That's actually changeable. We, we, can, we can decide that this police force will behave and will, will sort of come to see itself as you know, connected to the people they serve. That's a huge, that's, that's the reconcil re reconciling movement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. Let's let's <laughs> let's hope and also put our put our time and effort into making that a reality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I I do feel that for um, you know for white people who are seeing what's happening and feeling appalled, that that really it's it's you know it's it's a step on a journey to seeing that the system needs to change. Um, it's not. It's not just one thing. It's it's looking inside ourselves and kind of understanding our relationship to race, but but also to ourselves. Um, you know the the excluded bits. At you know both at the the macro and the micro level, um, and the bits the bits of us that are are served by not seeing, um, and, and allowing things to go unchecked. Um, so yeah, some real, um, you know, hard work, but really good work as well. Um, for yeah, for a lot of us, and all that. And seeing the time, um, and I think we need to draw things to a close. Is there anything that you would like to say as as kind of to to round off? Our yeah. Call? Well, <laughs> um, I have one more. I can say I have one more I concept that I want to bring into this notion of, uh, of so this is another layer. So there's, I keep getting, I know I'm getting more abstract, but I really do feel it's, um, it's useful for those who, who can, who can receive it. I'll offer this to you or maybe you can receive it in the future. Mm. Um, there's another layer of conflict that I've been experiencing and, and I've been experiencing when I say that, I mean, you know, I'm a systemic constellation specific. I'm in the field all the time. I'm often feeling things in my body in the context of a system. So we've, we've thought about a system, we've sort of set it up, we put ourselves inside of it. And for a while I started feeling this strange, like tension that I could, where, where the dynamic, we couldn't resolve it. And I was like, oh, something's, what is causing this? Why is this? really hot <laughs> and we the places where we normally look we can't get to the resolution and my sensing of that is that you know because we're in the midst of a paradigm shift 
I don't know if you're hearing trucks, but um, we're, we're experiencing a tension between what I'm calling the projected future, meaning this, there's a kind of momentum that's already been set in motion. Mm -hmm. Patterns from the past that are wanting to, you know, assert themselves into the future. Mm -hmm. And this new paradigm that, we're, that we are bringing forward. And so we've already seen multiple times, even in just a few months, that the past that we were familiar with, which we often use to predict the future, we, we can't do that anymore. Our past does not predict the future. In fact, our present doesn't predict the future. And that creates a tension, a conflict that is not gonna be, you, you'll find some kind of resolution by looking to the past, but actually part of the answer to the conflict is how we're relating to the what's emerging, how we're relating to the emerging future and our creative relationship to the emerging future. So we can no longer expect, in fact, we have to find ways to resolve the momentum that was generating from those systems of oppression and extraction. We have to resolve those. We have to heal them. We have to transform them. But something new is happening. And um, you know, so finding this is part of our work to discover how to be in relationship with those, yeah. with those, um, multiple futures, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating, and and uh, yeah, really, really. Uh, it feels it feels kind of like almost ungrounding that sense that the you know the past doesn't have the same. Well, that there is a momentum that comes from the past, but it's, you know, it's taking us nowhere we want to go. That's yeah. right. So, it, and it gives me a sense of kind of being much more light on our feet and much more kind of, um, yeah, pulled, pulled to the, pulled forwards rather than pushed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really helpful, um, interesting um, imagery that, uh, yeah, I definitely will will take away with me. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. Okay, shall we end there? I think so. Thank you so much. I and it, I was able to, I'm, I'm actually quite kind of in awe that I was able to get all these things. I like, oh, I'm never going to get to all those things yeah. way too much. And yet here we were able to present it together. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. It's just lovely to meet you. And um, so, yeah, thank you so much for spending time with us all. Great. You're very welcome. Bye-bye.